Well, hello there, guys. I know you have been waiting eagerly to get the responses to your questions from my father. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to him and let him deal with this video. Okay, former lieutenant here answering some questions. Wonderful questions from around the world about us talking about fragging, a uh, serious part of the Vietnam War, probably other wars as well. 77 Arturas. Uh, wonderful, wonderful comment and question there. Thank you for sharing that story uh, about your own uh, personal experience during the Tet Offensive and the Roadrunners. I personally never met the Roadrunners, but the supply, the truck drivers, crucial part of the Vietnam War, crucial. Dally, you asked the question, are there any myths about the war you'd like to clear up? One of the things that I heard as I returned was about the uh, readiness or lack of it of the enemy. Viet Cong, of course, were in the south. Often they would uh, have their jobs or whatever they were doing, farmers in the daytime, guerrillas at night. However, the NVA from the north, often in some of the conflicts, for example, the Quezon Siege, a very famous siege. The uh, North Vietnamese actually had tanks, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps. Nobody really knew the numbers of troops. Uniforms, armed, uh, supplied by the Russians, of course. So this was not a bunch of ragtag guerrillas with uh, a few rifles. The, uh, the North Vietnamese who would work themselves down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail were, in fact, very well armed. So that's one of the myths that I'd uh, like to clear up. And thank you again for your question. Tank of Doom, you had a question about, did I see any Australian troops in Vietnam? Uh, I was aware they were there serving. I personally had no experience with Australians. Uh, my personal experience in our uh, particular area was with the South Korean infantry, and I'll answer a, a subsequent question about uh, the South Korean troops. Tomato or tomato? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but wonderful question again. Talking about the helicopters, were they a part of Vietnam? Huge. And as for engineers, uh, often the, uh, the Chinook cranes would be um, used as, uh, you know, getting materials into a place and then letting it down by cable, that sort of thing. Uh, the helicopters I personally flew in were, of course, the Huey, which was the workhorse of the war. The uh, Bell helicopter was a four-place, small bubble-type helicopter for uh, just carrying uh, people from one place to another, but not a lot of troops, anything like that. Uh, on a trip from Saigon back to where I was stationed in a Chinook, I was the only American uh, with a bunch of Vietnamese troops. And after the trip, I could not hear for approximately three days. Uh, there was damage to my hearing, which still uh, persists today. We used no ear protection, of course. It was just uh, something that we didn't know about. And uh, the, the helicopters were, uh, the Huey was, was the one that uh, did most of the work as far as shuttling the troops in and out the combat areas, picking up the wounded, et cetera. And I flew in those many, many times on the, on the way to, uh, to other areas from where I was stationed. Thank you again for your question. Kevin also mentioned you were soloing recently as a, a private pilot. My, I salute you for that. Uh, in 1975, I purchased and had a friend teach me how to fly. It was a, a Stinson Voyager, a 1947 four-place tailwheel aircraft. And uh, in the process of getting uh, from the private pilot's license to instrument rating, I discovered I was colorblind, which I never knew. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't go beyond uh, visual flight rules. But uh, the year I spent flying around as uh, a little bit of Red Baron was a lot of fun. So I wish you all the best. I don't know what your plans are, but uh, it's a very, very, sp very special place when you're in the sky. And uh, I wish you good luck. 
Terji, 439, an excellent question on how did we feel as soldiers that uh, this was not our war? Uh, remember, uh, I, I was very fortunate in that most of our activity was related to building a highway that was going to be uh, for the Vietnamese people uh, and the related structures, the bridges, the culverts. So our work was very, very positive and concrete and something that would uh, still be there once we left. However, for people who, uh, you know, the troops that were on patrol fighting, uh, this ended up being a total bullshit kind of war. Uh, the kinds of things that happened, the killing, sometimes uh, you would get the feeling it was just not your time. Your buddy next to you was killed, you survived all the things in combat that would happen. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, was a machine gunner, for example, was taken out. His Marine unit would be taken out into the fields and dropped on Mondays, and they would be picked up again and brought back to a base camp on Saturday afternoons to, uh, to have a Saturday night and a Sunday to uh, try to recover, lick their wounds, and... Uh, he tells me very much so that this was not his war. What the hell were we doing there? So yes, among the fighting troops, that would absolutely be the predominant uh, feeling among uh, the soldiers that were out there on the front line, so to speak. Thank you again for that question. Prince Manzer asked a question, have I ever been ambushed by Viet Cong men? Uh, personally, not really an ambush would be uh, incoming fire from close range on just one occasion. And we'll be doing a, a subsequent uh, talk about that. Uh, I did receive incoming fire. It was from a distance. We returned fire. We could see puffs of smoke, but I would not call it an ambush. It was uh, from a distance. We simply got on the other side of our vehicles and felt, uh, you know, as long as we stayed on the other side, out of sight and return fire very carefully. We were not personally in danger. Um, the kind of thing that could happen, I went uh, north on a Saturday, for example, checking the culverts, just my Jeep driver and myself. The, uh, the, the day went fine. Lieutenant Dixon, a friend of mine, took Sunday and went south. A squad of 12 Viet Cong ambushed him and he did not survive. So you just never knew when you were working when you might uh, receive an ambush. So, uh, but personally, I never experienced that. Thank you again for your question. Kill G. Arslan, if I pronounce that correctly, had a, a wonderful question about what is Saigon like? What was it like at the time? I only spent five days in Saigon. I was looking for, uh, trying to find, which I did, a, an AWOL lieutenant from our, from our unit. Uh, Saigon <laughs> had so many, for example, bars uh, that were designed to uh, separate soldiers from their money. Uh, there would be music, beautiful Vietnamese women uh, who you would pay uh, overpriced drinks to buy the lady a drink and you would be engaged in conversation and when you're out in your unit, uh, in my case, a thousand guys. It was so nice to talk to a woman, especially an attractive woman, but it was just very expensive to do so. And I was not real comfortable in that environment. I did spend probably uh, $30 to buy uh, two drinks for a lady, and then I excused myself and left. But uh, the general rule was uh, you would keep going and then uh, prostitution would be part of the process. Uh, and, and, and that was very much um, a major part of uh, Saigon life as we, were, as we were there as Americans. Uh, one thing I did notice which was amazing was that uh, Saigon at that time, I don't know today, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, but at that time had no traffic lights. And I stood on a busy intersection that was about uh, five lanes of traffic in each direction, you know, perpendicular directions. 
And what would happen, about half the traffic would be motorcycles and then, of course, cars. And the traffic would be moving in one direction and the perpendicular traffic would ease out and cut off one lane of traffic, ease out, ease out. And pretty soon they would be going in the perpendicular direction. The others couldn't go. And it seemed to work. I saw no accidents. Imagine uh, no traffic lights and intersections in uh, here in the U.S. It was just a real interesting system, which uh, maybe it exists in other parts of the world. But that was a very new concept, which I've never forgotten about uh, Saigon at that time. And Trenchfoot, you asked a question about uh, members of the South Korean troops. We had a company assigned to us, our battalion of a thousand men, uh, and uh, the South Koreans were responsible for maintaining security in our area. I have to tell you, they were awesome. There was uh, one occasion of them chasing a squad of Vietnamese who ended up a couple miles away from uh, where we were, uh, which was real flat land next to the ocean. And uh, the squad ended up running into the hills, into a cave. And I spoke to uh, the company commander, how did they deal with that? And his answer was, it was real simple. They took a 55-gallon barrel of fuel oil to the uh, mouth of the cave, opened it, poured the fuel oil into the cave, and lit it with a match. And that was the end of the uh, 12 Viet Cong uh, soldiers. <laughs> They did not mess around. We, uh, in our area, had more problems with accidents than we did with enemy activity, which is a testament to just how good those South Koreans were. And on another occasion, I got the order to uh, take a road grader over to uh, grade the company area roads for them. You know, it was a lot of uh, sand and mud to, uh, to make them uh, easier to, you know, to, to drive the vehicles on. And as I was there, a, an ambulance came in. I'll never forget standing behind the ambulance. Uh, uh, a platoon of the, uh, of the uh, company had been involved in a firefight, and there were seven uh, seriously wounded South Korean soldiers in the back of the ambulance. Uh, every one of them were in shock. They had these blank look, looks on their faces. I'll never forget the sight of that, uh, them doing their job to protect uh, us in the work that we were doing on the highway. And uh, once my road grader finished uh, grading the company roads, we retreated to a South Korean lunch and I had my first kimchi. It was, wow, this is real food. So to this day, we keep kimchi uh, in our fridge. I love it. Thank you again for your, for your question. Chris, just want to say uh, thank you for sharing your story about your grandfather and the brothers that served in World War II. And uh, again, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed reading your story. All right. So in the coming weeks, uh, we'll have more uh, interviews like this with uh, other uh, subjects relating to the Vietnam War. And uh, again, I've really enjoyed your questions, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you again. Bye-bye.